Let's open in prayers. Abba Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you've brought us here this morning. I pray as we sang, your kingdom come, your will be done, Lord, in us as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your glory will descend upon us, that your power will fall afresh on us, that you will fill us afresh, and that will not just fall on this building, but it will overflow, that will touch those people outside the building. Lord, I pray your hand upon the message I'm about to bring, Lord, that it will be your words, not my words, Lord, but you, you will speak to us, Lord. Lord, that your words will cause us to fall deeper in love with you, cause us to grow deeper in love towards one another, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Many years ago, there was a movie called The Greatest Story Ever Told. Has anyone ever seen that one? Yes, if you will. It was Charlton Heston in there, so then you, you can date that movie with him then. So the greatest story ever told, <laughs> which was also the greatest mystery ever told, because it was the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus is how God came down in the form of a man to redeem us, to bring us back into fellowship with him. And it's also the story, the greatest story of the greatest treasures ever brought. That's what I'm going to be talking about this morning, treasures, God's treasures. If you've got your Bible there with you, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But as it is written, and that's what Jesus always said, it is written. So we should say that too, it is written. If the enemy comes along, tries to attack us, it is written. Because the enemy tries to come along and say, is it written? So we need to say, it is written. Um, what did I just say? 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. 9 and 10. <laughs> that's it. I've got my eye on you. <laughs> that's it. That's it. But as it is written, I has not seen, no ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. There's a couple other scriptures I'm going to read that go with that. Don't worry about going there. I'm just going let, to let you know what they are. They're Colossians 2, 2 and 3. The reason that he's got these things for us is that their hearts may be comforted being joined together in love and to all riches of the full understanding, to the full knowledge of the mystery of God, even of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And the reason we have that, we see in Colossians 4.12, that you may stand fully grown and being complete in all the will of God. Yeah, so he's brought treasures, he's brought gifts. The greatest gift he brought was that he's redeemed us, that he's opened up the way for us to get back in fellowship with him. So the kingdom of heaven can be compared to treasure being hidden in a field, which, which finding a man hid there, and then he goes away and sells everything as much as he has, and he buys that field. Now imagine you're, walking, you're out there on your daily walk, and you come across a property that's for sale, and you're just about to go past, and you hear a little, see a little twinkling there as you go past. Something catches your eye. Yeah, so you go closer and have a look, very much like Moses in the burning bush. You duck down, and under that bush, you see the, something shining, and it's a piece of gold. Yeah, so, so you go you go down to bend up to pick it up, but you can't. So, oh, it must be decent size. So you scratch away the dirt so you can free it. And you do a bit, and you have a look around, no one's looking. You try and pick it up, but you still can't. And then to mind comes, you know, in Australia, they found these massive nuggets wearing kilos and kilos and kilos. So what you're going to probably do is you're going to cover all that up, take that number on the real estate sign and say, how much is that property going for? And then you're going to ring up and you're going to buy that property because there's gold there, probably millions of dollars worth. So God's kingdom is filled with those incomprehensible riches. He hides them all over the place for us. 
Um, you may be familiar with the story, you know, where God feeds the birds. You know, he feeds the sparrows, but he doesn't throw it in their nest. They have to go out and get the treasure. So you have to work hard to find those hidden treasures. They don't come easy. You know, in the past we had gold rushes in California and America as well as here in Australia. You know, and people would sell up everything they had to, you know, stake their claim, you know, to get their, I don't know how big the claims were, a couple of meters at times, sometimes bigger. But they, they hoped to find that gold, you know, that make their millions. Other people, you know, they hoped to hear someone give them a stock tip and, uh, you know, they put all their money on the stock and hope it keeps going up and they make their treasures that way. And then still others of us in the past, we used to get up early on Boxing Day and we'd line up at, I don't know, John Martin's or Myers for the Boxing Day sales, you know, and there'd be thousands lining up pressing against the gates for that one treasure, you know, one discounted fridge, you know, brand new fridge down to $100 and they'd clamor to get that treasure. So, you know, we have to work hard to find the treasures. Treasures aren't revealed easy because if they were, then, then all of us would be having them. Hmm? It wouldn't be a treasure, that's right. So God's word, his word is the ultimate and highest authority in the land and in our lives. And there's no higher authority than him. There's no one above him. There's no one above God. So what God says goes. He's it. And his word contains, this word here, the Bible contains all of his directions, of his goodness, of his wisdom and knowledge and treasures. And Paul's been going through Psalms and now Ecclesiastes, and he is going through the wisdom literature. And I hope you're all watching and you know, growing in wisdom and knowledge, and all the treasures that, that God has in store for us. Oops. And it's just timed out. <laughs> I do have a backup with me, though, so just in case, you never know what happens. <laughs> so the Bible is how God speaks to us and how He reveals things to us. The Bible is evergreen. You know, it will never be obsolete. It was true yesterday, true and valid yesterday, and it's true and relevant today, and it'll still be true and relevant tomorrow and from there forward. And that's what the word evergreen means. It's ever valid. It doesn't change. It doesn't you know, become obsolete, out of date. So like God who is unchanging, so also his word is unchanging. That's what I said there. You know, it's evergreen. Proverbs 25.2. Now, don't go there. I'm just going to... You know, read these scriptures out to you so you can listen to them. God tells us it's his glory to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search them out. So in Isaiah 45, 3, he tells us that he will give us the treasures of darkness, even treasures in secret places, that you may know that he is Jehovah who calls you by your name. He calls us by our name. How good is that? Then Colossians 1.27, to whom God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery among the nations, who is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that's the greatest treasures for us. And yeah, if we have a look there at Proverbs 25.2 again, it's the glory of kings to search it out, which is good news for us, because he's made us kings and priests. We're kings and priests in his kingdom. And so it's our glory. It's our glory to search these things out. It's our privilege to search out what he's got for us. To uncover the hidden treasures and to be found that are found in the Bible. To study, to dig deeper, to show us approved of God so that we can accurately handle his word and use it. Jeremiah 29, 13 tells us that we will seek and find them when we search for him with all of our heart. In other words, we search for him with everything that we've got. We put it all on the line. We hold nothing back with all of our heart. That's what that means. Let's, let's take a look, though, at what that means, you know, like when you give it all you've got. And, and I'm going to use an example as an athlete. Every four years, the Olympics come around, and all these athletes, they want to go for gold. So what do they do during those four years? In Australia, most often they would head to the AIS, which is the Australian Institutes of Sport. You know, so they commit to four years for that gold medal. And every day they train hard. Come rain, hail, or snow. And in Canberra you get snow. And I used to train under 12s soccer team in snow. It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> so they do that. You know, they, every day they get up early. They, you know, they just commit everything. 
their diets, they change them, they optimize them. Everything in their life gets optimized you know, for that one shot at gold at the end of the four years. You know, they, they sacrifice everything there. Everything is monitored, every, everything is measured, you know, so to the minutest level. You know, they wanna they wanna have the best shot at getting that gold medal. That what they're going through is fairly much what it's gonna take for us as well for our uh, for our run, for our race on this on this earth. Our race is to proclaim God's kingdom until he comes. So we want to be like Paul at the end of his life where he said, I'd run the race. He kept proclaiming God's kingdom. I've kept the faith. I've endured to the end. So I know which one I'd prefer. I'd prefer to hear God say when we reach heaven, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, enter into my rest rather than some dusty old gold medal which isn't really gold at all. No. It's pretend gold. Gold plated. It <laughs> cost them too much. I mean, the price of gold, $1,700 an ounce. They deserve it. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians one we we're told that as many promises are of God, in Him they yes and amen. Yes and amen. And you also remember that amen means so be it. Let it be done. You know, so when you agree in prayer and say amen, you're saying let it be done as God has declared. And what you're doing is you're agreeing and aligning yourself with what God says. Because we want to be aligned with what God says. We want to be in step with what he says. Otherwise, things don't go so well for us. Now imagine if I told you that while you're here right now this morning, sitting here, I had instructed someone to go and hide $20 million in your house while you're sitting here. <laughs> I I'd in, I'd instructed them to hide it really, really well, not just all in the one place, not you just open the door and come in and there sits $20 million in the pallet, but all hidden throughout your house. Now, they're hiding it really well, so you have to search hard for it. So when you get home later on, how would you search for it? What would you do? I don't even imagine there'd be some of you here right now, if, uh, if on your phone went off and went off, there's $20 million in your house, you'd be probably go rushing off right now. I might do that. <laughs> 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 Let me check. <laughs> so how hard would you search for it when you got home? How long would you search for it? You know, would you search for it until you got all the $20 million? You know, the most obvious place that you would look at first, you know, like you'd look in the cupboards, you know, in your dresses, under the bed, in the mattress, in the mattress, that's it. You know, $20 million, and then you might think, oh, where's it hidden? Is it in the wall cavities, in the roof, in the shed? Remember, it's guaranteed to be there. So we've got to work at it. Could be hidden anywhere. I remember mom, mom telling me a story when when my uncle died, she went back to Germany, there was a brother, and she had to clean out his flat. You know, so he'd, he'd lived in the one flat for some like 77 years, he was born in it, so he'd never moved. And you know, she started cleaning up and she you know, started packing up books and she came across some money in a book. And she knew that it, her the brother did these things. You know, so then she had to look through every book and she found tons of money and then she had to check all the pockets and his clothing and found more money. So it was all over the place. You know, so treasure was hidden. She found it. I mean, I, I've done this myself before. You know, you put on a jacket and you put your hand in a pocket. Oh, what's that? Oh, money. Where'd that come from? <laughs> I mean, I've, I've even used money for bookmarks in the past and you'd leave it in the book and then you, <laughs> then you read it and then you think, wow, you know, it's, it's so blessed. It's a bit harder to do nowadays. No one spends money anymore. They spend it on their phone. I know I do on my phone, I don't carry any cash whatsoever. But that's fairly much what God does for us, you know, with us in our Bibles. You know, he hides treasures in there for us. He leaves clues, breadcrumbs, you know, fairly much like Hansel and Gretel. You know, they left you know, little breadcrumbs and stones to find their way back. And I'm sure God, God waits with bated breath, you know, like as, as we're reading, you know, and he's going, oh, Alex is up to a certain spot. And he goes, you're getting warmer, warmer, hot, hot. And then you find something and he goes, yes, he's got it. <laughs> so, 
that's that's you know that's that's what I can picture him doing. I mean, we do the same. We we wrap up presents for people, especially our kids, you know, and they're there. And there's some people pick the paper really delicately, you know. I just come on, get to it. Just rip it off. And you know, we, we're like that as well. Now, also remember that he told us that all those who search will find. That's his guarantee. It comes with a guarantee. There's treasures in here. If you look, you will find. And God cannot change. He cannot lie. So it's always there for us, that guarantee. Some things in our Bible, they're obvious enough. You know, I always say, you know, give the Bible to the six-year-old and ask them what it means, and they will tell you. you know, but then there's other things that we need to dig deeper in. Other things only become obvious when we you know, study, really look, intense scrutiny. You know, and then it's the Holy Spirit that reveals these things to And then there's really deep nuggets where you really have to dig in harder and just you know, have a look at things. It's a bit, bit like a you know, cryptic crossword. Anyone here like cryptic crosswords or puzzles? Or those crazy wooden puzzle boxes that Greg has? <laughs> you know, you look at things and... Mm, And then eventually you get it open. You know, I, used to, I used to love going into Aldi's for treasures. Not for the food shopping. <laughs> Probably all guys know this. Well, the other place would, that this works for is Bunnings, actually. <laughs> But in Aldi's, you have a middle aisle, and the treasures are new. Not every morning, but uh, probably once a week there. <laughs> So, you know, you go there, what can I find? You know, like you, you have no need for something because, you know, Karen and I, we're trying to get rid of stuff. We don't want to get more stuff. So, you know, God's word can also be likened to, you know, the mysteries that we find, to a treasure map. When we search, we don't have to do it on our own. It's the Holy Spirit that guides us if we let him and if we listen to his whisper. He usually speaks in a still, quiet voice. You know, we are living such busy lives that we can often miss that. You know, we, we have everything on so loud, you know, we've got music on, we've got our phone, we're always scrolling through our phone. And uh, you can also have a look at the Bible, a bit like an Enigma code. Who knows, who's heard of the Enigma code? Yeah. So, you know, Germans coded up and they sent secret messages and they were doing quite well in the war. And then eventually the Allies, they were able to decode it and that's when it all went downhill from them. But, you know, God hides things like that, you know. He's saying, who's going to dig in? You know, who's going to spend the time and the effort to, you know, find what I've got for them? Everyone who searches, who seeks, will find what God has laid out for us. He tells us if we ask, he will answer. If we seek, he will reveal. If we knock, he will open. And it's the Holy Spirit who is the key. He's the key in our lives to opening these things up for us. Now our Bibles, they're one of the most remarkable books that have ever been written. It's a number one bestseller, over five billion dollars, uh, five billion, over five billion <laughs> copies, you know, have, have been sold. You know, the, the next one down is so far down the bottom, it doesn't even come close. I was actually looking up as well, you know, how many words are in the Bible? <laughs> There's a... Uh, Yeah, there's roughly over 700,000 words in the Bible, you know, so I thought, well, you know, if we equated each word as an ounce of gold, if that's the kind of value that we put on, it would give us one and a half billion dollars worth of treasure in here. But his words are not, you can't put a price on them. And it's also not just, you know, it's a book here, it's 66 books written in one, it's not just a one, not just a one book, written by over 40 authors over thousands of years. So if you do one of those Bible plans, you know, when you read the Bible in a year, you know, and if someone asks you, you know, how many books you read? Ah, oh, more than one a week. More than one a week. That sounds good, doesn't it? It wasn't just written by men, though, this book. You know, it was written divinely inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that every single word in our Bible is breathed by God. It's divinely inspired. It's got power. It's th this Bible has got its creative power. This has, you know, created the world. Um, Jesus and the apostles affirmed the validity of the Old Testament by quoting extensively from it. You know, so that validates the Old Testament, which in turn validates the New Testament. Now you've also would have heard it said that the Old Testament is a New Testament revealed, and the New Testament, the Old Testament, uh, 
revealed, that's it. <laughs> um, now all the books in the Bible validate each other as one coherent message. We have substantially more historical evidence for a Bible in terms of total numbers of documents found in any, any other historical works. I mean, it's astounding. Untold archaeological support, um, as well as evidence from non-sympathetic authors, in other words, non-Christians, unbelievers. And also the Bible contains 65,000 cross-references. Yeah, there's a chart there I saw you know, where things cross-reference each other. It's incredible. Then you can go, there's, um, there's a Russian mathematician that did some numerical studies and everything lines up in there. You can't write something like that. You might be able to write a sentence like that, but not an entire book with uh, over 700,000 words. The Bible provides us with evidence for God's supernatural engineering. Contan uh, as contains evidence for his design and accurately predicts future events through prophetic revelations, predicting events with precise timing and incredible detail. We see that in Isaiah 46.10 where God tells us that he declares the end from the beginning and ancient times from what is still yet to come. And right now we're living in incredible times where a lot of God's prophecies are in play. Jesus said he would come back. His disciples asked him, what are some of the signs? You know, when your return is near. Well, you know, you have a look. There's rumors of wars. Well, we have wars. There's famines. There's natural disasters. You know, we have earthquakes ever more frequent all around. I think there's a couple in the Middle East at the moment. And there'll be plagues. You know, we've had that. And, you yeah, know, people will get worse and worse out there. And we've also seeing that right now. So our Bibles give us the gospel, which simply means the good news. It's the good news of God's plan of salvation, a treasure in and of itself. And there's no greater treasure than that. We mostly assume, though, that the good news is only found in the New Testament. But it's not. The good news is also found all throughout and woven throughout the Old Testament. And it's mentioned at its very earliest in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. What God is saying here to Satan is that there will be a redeemer born of the seed of the woman, of Eve, who will crush his head. The plan of redemption mentioned right there, good news. God wasn't caught unawares. And it was a prediction that pointed to a future redeemer being born and was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. So when he came, he fulfilled that promise through the crucifixion, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father, which has opened up the door for us to come back into his presence. The good news, the plan of salvation was in God's mind even before that, even before he began the act of creation. So, you know, God didn't get caught on, ooh, they did this, I better do something. That's not him. Hebrews 11, 6 shows us that without faith, it's impossible to be pleasing to God. Is that me? No. <laughs> Hope not. For it is necessary for the one drawing near to God to believe that he is and that he is a, becomes a reward of the one seeking him out. There are mysteries to be revealed, treasures to be found, and prophecies to be uncovered and sought out. The Bible is chock full from beginning to end. All 730,000 words. We see that with Daniel. You know, with Daniel interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Ah, it's Andrew. <laughs> Another trouble, my right? Greg and Andrew, there you go, the dynamic duo. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and it troubled him and puzzled him. So he called all the wisest of his wisest, trusted advisors, and he, he wanted them to interpret the dream. But there was a slight twist. Not only were they to give him interpretation of the dream, but they were also to tell him the dream. And these guys had no clue. They tried to weasel you know, out of Nebuchadnezzar. He said, tell us your dream and uh, we'll give you the interpretation. They probably would have made something up. But he said, no, nah, tell me the dream. And in the end, he got, just got fed up with them and he commanded that it all be put to death. So then Daniel heard about it. And he was asked to be taken to the king. 
And the king asked of Daniel the very same thing that he'd asked of his advisors. Tell me the dream and then tell me the interpretation. And Daniel asked him that he would give him a bit of time so he could pray and consult with God. And God revealed the dream to him in a vision. And Daniel pleased, uh, praised the God of heaven. And in Daniel 2, 20 to 23, we find him saying this. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells in him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us a dream of the king. So then he went back to the king and told him his dream and its interpretation, saying, No wise man, no enchanter, no magician, no diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God. And with us, there's always a but God. Something happens, but God. But there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. So God had revealed a dream to Daniel, and the result being that God was glorified, and Daniel was put in place in, of a higher authority in the land. And then there's Joseph, the same Joseph who was ditched by his brothers and sold into slavery. So there he was sitting in jail after falsely accused and arrested. And while there he accurately predicted the dream of a cupbearer and a baker, with the baker being executed and the cupbearer being restored into his position. He'd, he'd only asked the cupbearer, when you get back with Pharaoh, remember me. So one night, Pharaoh had a dream. And I always try and pronounce it like a German would pronounce uh, Pharaoh. And as a German, I would pronounce that Pharaoh. Oh. <laughs> Same thing with a place in the York Peninsula called uh, Minlaten. First time I pronounced it, it was, I called it Minlaten to a word <laughs> I'm going to meet you in Minlaten. <laughs> anyway, so one night Pharaoh had a dream which no one in his kingdom could interpret. It, it was then that Joseph's previous inmate, the cupbearer, remembered what he had done for him and he mentioned and, and his promise and he told Pharaoh that there's someone he knew who would be able to interpret his dream for him. Now the time period between him actually being released and telling it to Pharaoh was 14 years. So um, he took his time. It was then that they got Joseph out of jail, they cleaned him up, dressed him up and they took him into Pharaoh's presence and uh, Joseph said to Pharaoh, it is not in me God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. He was then able to accurately interpret the dream and from then on became the second most powerful man in Egypt. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7, Paul tells us that we speak the wisdom of God having been hidden in a mystery which God predetermined before the ages of our glory. And 1 Corinthians 2, 10, but God revealed to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things even the depth of God. You know, so as we're walking with God, God will give us wisdom. He will open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds. You know, so we'll come across problems and God will give us insight. He'll give us wisdom. There are treasures everywhere. They're just waiting for you to find. Often when we read our Bibles, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that has done this, you know, we skip over what we might think are the boring bits. <laughs> you know, when they do measurements, when God... You know, Consensus data, numbering people, or, you know, endless genealogies. You know, where it goes, so-and-so, we got so-and-so, we got so-and-so, and so on, and so on. You know, I used to do that. Now, then I determined at one stage, now I'm going to read every single word, because every word is burdened by God. Everything is there for a reason. So it's when we skip what we think is mundane, what appears to be boring, that there's often a nugget of wisdom hidden right there. And I found so many among lists of names and things like that. It's just incredible. So remember, every word, let's say, is given by inspiration of God. And as Paul mentioned last week, everything, every single word that he includes is there for a specific reason. Nothing is redundant. So in saying that, what we're actually going to be doing now is we're going to go read through a genealogy. We're going to go to Genesis 5. Now you can open that up and read along, or you can listen to me reading through it, because there are treasures hidden in there. 
Now, the names that we're going to go through aren't always translated from the Hebrew meaning. It takes a bit of digging around for you to unravel the true meaning. So, in Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. So, we're like God. God created Adam from the dust of the earth, and he breathed his spirit in him. Adam's name means man. So, remember that. You know, if you take notes, underline man. And then reading on, he created the male and female and he blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. And number three, and Adam lived 130 years and kept and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. His name there meaning appointed. And we get the name's meaning from Genesis 4.25. And Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for the me instead of Abel, whom Cain call, uh, killed. So, write down appointed. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 100 years, uh, 105 years, and begot Enosh. His name is from the root of Enosh and means mortal. Write that down. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan, and his name means sorrow. After he begot Canaan, just write that down, sorrow. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. So Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. His name means the blessed God, which is from Mahalal, blessed, and El, the name of God. After he begot Mahalal, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. And they all seemed to live a very long time. Mahalal lived 65 years and begot Jared, which is from the verb Yarat, and it means shall come down. Just write that one down. Shall come down. After he begot Jared, Mahalal lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalal were 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch, his name meaning teaching. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And here's a... Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Methuselah's name meaning his death shall bring. His death shall bring, write that down. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. And here's another little treasure nugget coming up. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And so God caught him away. In other words, he raptured him. Of Rapture is a Latin word which means caught away, which we get in our New Testament. Um, Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. His name meaning despairing, from which we get lament or lamentations. So write down despairing. After he begot lament, Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had many more sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his son Noah, saying, this one will comfort us, right, comfort us down concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. And then it just keeps going. So what we're going to have a look at is, we looked through 10 names there. There's a message from God here. So the meaning of the names as I was going through them, Adam means man. Seth, appointed, is, is, is the meaning of his name. Enosh, means mortal, Canaan, sorrow, Mahalalel, the blessed God, Jared, shall come down, Enoch, means teaching, Methuselah, his death shall bring, Lamech, the despairing, Noah, comfort or rest. So hidden in the meaning of all those names is a beautiful message from God, but his saving grace. And what it spells out is, man appointed mortal, sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching, his death shall bring the despairing comfort 
and rest. So, so right there. So that, that's, we have, that's one treasure, and there's many, many others like that, you know, when we come across these things, and, you know, with computers, it makes it so e easy to find some of these things. He's come to give the despairing comfort and rest. That's what we do when we go out there proclaiming his kingdom. We're offering comfort and rest to those that don't have comfort and rest. And that's, that's what we're called to do in running our race, to give, you know, offer comfort and rest, to get people to come in. So I can only recommend you dig deep, check out every detail. There are great nuggets to be uncovered and found, and God always, always rewards those who diligently seek him. And as we find these things, then we really need to share them with each other and say, hey, have a look what I found. Oh, I hadn't seen that. Well, I found this here. Oh, how great is that? Because in Luke 8.10, he tells us, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He's given us the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The world doesn't have that. We do. You know, and it's like I said, we need to go out, proclaim his kingdom, show the treasures, let people know what God has done in our lives. So if someone would like to come up and play the piano, which probably be Bo. <laughs> We're just going to finish off in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you that you revealed your mysteries, your treasures, your goodness, your love, your mercy to us, Lord. And I pr pray that the words that we heard this morning, they will bear fruit in our hearts, that will cause us to grow, that will cause us to rejoice in you, that will cause us to lift you up higher, Lord, to proclaim your name, to proclaim your kingdom. And I pray as we go out this week, Lord, that we will go out in an attitude of worship. But that we will not let the worship dissipate, but we will keep that attitude of worship. That we will go out this week and that we will be light bearers, Lord. Lord, that we will shine forth your light. Lord, that when people look at us, they will see you. Lord, they will be drawn unto you, Lord. Lord, and I pray that you give us strength, that you give us boldness. Lord, that we will not be timid, that we will be attentive to what the Holy Spirit says. So that you will be done in us, Lord, that your kingdom will come in us. In Jesus' mighty name I pray this, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. And if anyone has any need for prayer, touch from God, feel free to come up, and someone will pray with you.